Father in heaven, <clears throat> it's probably not a person here who's not been to a wedding and not heard that Bible passage read, but we understand, Lord, that it's got to do with far more than a couple in love and uh, loving each other, but to do with what takes place in the body of Christ and the church and how we ought to conduct ourselves in and outside the church. Father, they are words that are pleasing to the ear but very hard to apply. We can't do it without your spirit. So woo us into obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday when I had the mission team over for a kind of a debrief breakfast and a celebration, uh, that's the Malta mission team, we, I asked the question and we went around answering the question, what was it that you discovered about yourself and you know, what area in you, in, within your life that you want to work on as a result? And really people were quite humble in talking about the struggles and, uh, and a particular area. And really what they were doing was talking about the fruit of the Spirit, some area in their life where they wanted to grow. The Apostle Paul describes it as the fruit, singular, of the Spirit, the work of God in a person's life to help them to become more like Jesus. It's not the basis for why we're accepted by God, and Heidi explained that so beautifully. It's our response to what God has done in forgiving us. The fruit of the Spirit are captured in nine words in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. Today we're going to look at one of them as we start a series of four weeks on the fruit of the Spirit. And today it's love, the one that heads the fruit. Now I'll be honest with you, I chose 1 Corinthians 13 because this chapter has really got under my skin. I, I haven't preached it very much in my life. In fact, I preached it quite late. It was only three years ago that I actually preached it in a series on 1 Corinthians 13. And it's not surprising that the, the church that loved the least gets the best definition of love. Because this church at Corinth that Paul is writing to um, is a church that found a way of dividing on more ways than you can shake a stick at. They divided over leadership. They divided over the Lord's Supper. They divided over litigation and suing each other. Yes, they went to court suing each other. They divided over gifts. They thought themselves so darn spiritual, but they were so profoundly immature that they, because of simply, in this section, they just prided themselves on their particular gift, the gifts of the Spirit, and ignored the fruit of the Spirit. And smack bang in the middle of these three chapters, chapters 12, 13 and 14, you get this chapter that speaks about the most excellent way, which is love. So let's begin. And really the beginning of this chapter is captured in a formula. We had a version of this when we looked at uh, the church at Ephesus in Revelation last term. And the formula is simply this. Gifts minus love equals nothing. Let me read to you the opening three verses. If I speak in the tongues or the languages of men and or of angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong, a gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and give, all my, and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. That is such a radical set of sentences. Oh, to speak in the language of angels. But without love, I just sound like a car crash. Oh, to plunge the mysteries of the universe and to have such faith that you can uproot Mount Kosciuszko and repark it in your front yard. But if your life is lived in loveless relationships, you are nothing. Oh, to be so generous that you give, forget 10%, 50%, 90%, give 100% of all you have to the poor. And if you are so committed to Jesus and, and refuse to be ashamed of him that you'll take the bullet for Christ, but you conducted yourself in relationships without love, you gain nothing. It won't be the first biography on a famous missionary who did great work for the Lord, but when it came to their own family, they left behind a loveless mess. And the result is heroic gifts. I think the formula is on the screen. Heroic gifts without love equals nothing. Let me take you back to maths. Remember math class? 
I know it was a bad memory for most of us. Sorry you maths teachers out there, there's a few out there, and we love you. If you multiply one big number by another big number, usually you get a bigger number, like, here's an example. Five times eight equals? 40, yeah, someone said 33 or something this morning. <laughs> the education system is still, is still working. And it, 11 times 12, now that's a big one. Huh? I know you're getting your calculator now, aren't you? 132. <laughs> one big number by another big number gives you a much bigger number. But if you multiply any number with zero, what do you always get? Yeah, look at the next. 100 times zero is? 10,000 times zero is? 1 billion times zero is? Yeah, right. Point here is, doesn't matter what you do, anything you do times zero love equals nothing. But wait a minute, I thought giving money to the poor was a loving act, and of course it is. But what Paul wants to do is now go into detail about the do's and don'ts of love. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing you notice about this list is that, man, it's practical. Harvard's Biz Business Review did a study and said 95% of people can't apply a principle. So if I say to you, go and love one another, you're scratching your head thinking, what does that exactly mean? So Paul says, I know you're not going to get it, so let me tell you how to get it. This is not like a love song, you know, all of me loves all of you, whatever that means. <laughs> the Bible gets... It's a good song, I actually like it. But the Bible... And I know it's old now. But the Bible gets... Once you get down and dirty when it comes to love. Look at verse 4, kind of now. Paul says, you, you, you want to know how to love? Let me tell you. Verse 4, love is patient. Mmm, drat. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. So let's pick up the first one. It's not, it, love is patient. Or in verse 5, a similar point. It's not easily angered. Really. Literally, patient means love suffers long. So straight out of the block, blocks, we're reminded. This is love with difficult people. This is love in hard places. This is love with when you're tired and grumpy and annoyed. This is love at 6 o'clock in the morning, even when you're not a morning person. Or 11 o'clock at night when you're not a night person. Love. You know, the, the church, someone said it so beautifully, and I, it feels so true to me. The church is like throwing a whole lot of porcupines into a suitcase. You know those prickly things that they got? Sort of get. How else do we get to make this thing work if it's not love? It's like an engine without oil. What's going to happen? It's going to seize up. No matter how brilliantly the machine is made, if there's no oil, we're going nowhere. If there's no love, we're going nowhere. Love, long-suffering, slow to anger. And guess what? That's exactly how God describes himself. When he revealed his glory to Moses way back in Exodus 34, he said this, I am the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He's a long-suffering God, very patient God. It's why the Bible's so big, because <laughs> he's so patient with us. And the, book compri the Bible comprises of 66 books. And you know what each of them are? 66 love letters to his people. So those of us with short fuses, take note. Love is not easily angered. Um, it's not quick to grumble. I asked the staff last year at a staff meeting, at the end of last year, I said, guys, give me some feedback. I, I want you to pick up on one area of strength I have as a leader and one area you'd like me to work on and change. And um, Scott Lavender. Now, Scott has got to be the most encouraging human being I've ever met in my whole life. He really has the gift of encouragement. I thought I did until I met him. <laughs> And, I, and Scott came out of the blocks first and he said some really kind things. And then he said, but Ray, sometimes I'm not sure which Ray I'm going to get. You get what he's getting at? What he's getting at, what he's really saying is, Ray, I'm not sure whether I'm, get, I'm going to get patient Ray or short fuse Ray. And um, somehow coming from Scott, it meant all that much more. Many of us have not quite come to terms with the fact that we live in a world that is broken. We live outside the garden after the fall and we expect our plans to go smoothly and, uh, you know, watch out if anyone gets in our way. But no matter how organised you are, and it, 
And it pays to be organised. But no matter how organised you are, God will throw you curveballs because it's in the brokenness of this world that he's actually shaping you to be more like him and bear the fruit of the Spirit. We know stuff happens. Cars get stuck in traffic. Engines break down. Holidays get rained on. People say cutting words. Babies cry all night. Friends let you down. Uh, Speakers blow. Oh man, those suckers have blown a few times this year. Christians can criticise, disappoint, slander, gossip and undermine. John Piper, the American preacher, talking on this passage said, If I'm going to love like this, then something in me has got to die. My strong craving for a trouble-free life must die. My need for uninterrupted schedules must die. My demandingness that frustrations and interference must get out of my way must die. Because love is patient. It's not easily angered. You know, there are 16 things said in this verse about what love is and what it isn't. But whatever else it is, friends, she's patient. (laughs) She's long-suffering. Doesn't get easily angered. So let's look at that list again. Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, does not boast, is not proud. Now I'm not going to pick up on all of these because we're going to pick up on some of them as we look at the other fruit of the Spirit. But only to say this, that the Christian, Corinthian Christians were receiving a really kind letter from Paul. He actually wrote four of them to, to this church. But man, they were impatient, proud, arrogant, and full of themselves. They were full of envy. And they bit each other in the back and they undermined and they split the church in 50 different ways. Because love is not what you do, it's what you don't do. Look at verse uh, 4. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy. Let's put it another way. Love rejoices in the success of others. Um, you know, when you, when you have envy, you have a thing called, the Germans have a word called schadenfreude. I love the word. It just sounds good. Just say schadenfreude. Why don't you say it with me? Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. <laughs> uh, it's, got, it's got a feel to it, doesn't it? It means malicious joy, nasty joy. When you kind of take pleasure in the setbacks of others. Have you ever had that experience? Of course you have. The reverse is the case, as one man said, whenever a friend of mine succeeds, a little part of me dies inside. (laughs) What is it about us? Whenever a friend of mine succeeds, a little part of me, I'm envious, I resent the fact. And you know what it's like, there's someone in your life you've latched onto as a point of comparison. It can be a sister, a brother, it can be a friend, it can be someone at work, it can be another Christian in the church. You've just kind of, you said, they're my point of reference and when they go ahead then I feel bad and when they take a step back you know when the relationship breaks I'm quietly happy when the, when they get a new relationship I'm resentful you know that deal I, I said to someone this morning I said in the sermon this morning it's a real battle when when you're battling with infertility and and you're really grieving a real grief that's really that grief is really honored in the Bible and then you hear of someone who got pregnant. Maybe they got pregnant for the fifth time. And there's some mums who are shooting our babies like every year. And you hear of it. It's so hard not to be envious. So hard not to be resentful. But you know the only solution to envy is to, in your heart, thank God for their blessing and success. And then go to them and tell them that you thank God for their success. And rejoice with them. Love means you let people know that you're happy for them. Man, that's hard. Even when it's killing you inside, it's so good to do. It's like you're pulling the root of envy out of the soil and letting it die. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Uh, In the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says that the church is like one body. Uh, where every member has been baptised in the Holy Spirit. And so that because we're one body, and one tight unit, when one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. So, when you hear, when you hear of someone succeeding, make it your aim to encourage them. I mean, look, let's take a minute right now. Who is that one person you kind of resent 
because they're doing really well. Look, I don't even mind if you do it right now. Yes? Smack bang in the middle of a sermon. You can text someone right now. Now, I wouldn't suggest someone at church because they'll know you've been resenting them. <laughs> and that could get a little bit awkward. But you know, maybe your brother and sister's at home or a friend. Tick, 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 tick. I just want to say I'm really happy that you got the job or that you're in this new relationship. Just, I'm really happy for you. Just that little... Tick. That's the way you deal with envy. Perhaps you feel like uh, your whole life is like one big water polo game. You know water polo where you know, the way you lift yourself up from the water so often is by leveraging off somebody else. For you to lift yourself up, someone's got to be pushed down. There's a better way of living life, let me tell you. It's called love. And love not only doesn't envy, it keeps no record of wrongs. Look at verse 5. It does not dishonour others, respects them. It's not self-seeking, puts the other person first. It's not easily angered, we've already seen that. And it keeps no record of wrong. Doesn't it sound like Jesus? In fact, in this chapter, you can take the word love, you can take the word love out and put the word Jesus in, and you will get a lovely description of who Jesus is. Jesus who keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus who, when they were beating him, nailing him, crucifying him, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But love doesn't keep, keep score on the mistakes of others. That is a very hard thing to do. Uh, and it, by the way, that's what, if that's you, and look, let's face it, that's all of us. It's very hard not to keep score on other people's mistakes. But it's what kills marriages. It's what kills relationships. It's what kills churches. It, it's what kills Bible studies. It's what kills friendships. It's what kills workplace relationships. Conversations that begin with, you always, or that's so typical of you, or you'll never change. You know, Jesus, think about it, Jesus, who is perfect, right? Never sinned his whole life. He never keeps score on your mistakes. Never. He says, I'll remember your sins no more. Whereas we, who are not perfect, we constantly keep score. Yeah, you failed here, you failed here, you failed here. You're out. You know, I love the idea of love, as long as I keep it theoretical. But the moment I start to think of people who are like a thorn in my side, man, this chapter kind of gets really under my skin. Like, it's a beautiful, isn't it a beautiful chapter? Love is patient, it's kind, it does not envy, so beautiful. And then I think of that person, mm, yeah. And then I think, Let's, what's, what's 1 Corinthians 14 like? Maybe that's easy to read. You know, the other thing about love is, it, it, and it's kind of in verse 6, he, he kind of changes gear a bit and says, um, speaks about the things that make you happy. It's getting a bit echoey up here. I don't know if you guys are aware of it yet. Love, um, love is kind of seen in the things that make you happy. So in verse 6, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Because God is love, love doesn't take pleasure in evil. This is really hard. And the kind of stuff we watch and the kind of stuff we laugh at. In fact, I often think, our, you know they say your eyes are a window into your soul. I think our laughter is a window into our soul. You kind of think of the things you laugh at and with, with a whole bunch of the kind of the modern stream of stand-up comedians at the moment. You think, hmm, you know if Jesus was standing right here, I'm not sure I'd be laughing. Because love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. I was, uh, I was in Blacktown Shopping Centre with my mum yesterday afternoon and I was talking to a lady and she, um, <coughs> she knew I was a minister and uh, I mean I let her know in the conversation and, and she said, so what do you think uh, about what's happening at the moment? And I said, what's happening at the moment? <laughs> it sort of came out of the blue. She said, you know the Royal Commission into Child Abuse? Oh, that thing. <laughs> I said, I said, um, it is very awful. She, she was an ex-Catholic. There was no way she was going to church anymore. She's just furious about the way the church has mishandled it. And I said to her, I mean, she didn't say all that at first. I just came out of the blocks because I knew she was coming, where she was coming from. I said, look, it's been very awful. And the church 
and, and I'm not saying like just our church. I'm not talking about MBM. I'm talking about the church, all the denominations. I said, we have failed to protect children in the past. We have behaved atrociously. We have not protected those who could not protect themselves. And it's taken the government to shame the church. And I, and I said this to her. I said, the thing about Jesus is he actually warned us. He said, anyone who causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better if they had a big stone placed around their neck and they were thrown in the deepest sea, a bit like a mafia trip. You know, when the, the mafia puts concrete shoes and sinks you to the bottom? He said, that's what God wants to do to anyone who harms kids. Because the thing about love is it hates what is evil. What does it say? Love does not delight in evil but it rejoices with the truth. And the truth is how the church has behaved has been evil and it needs to be named for what it is. In this church, they were celebrating their freedom in Christ and really rejoicing over the fact that one guy was actually having sex with his stepmom, And they thought, praise the Lord, we're free in Christ to do whatever we like. But the thing about love is it doesn't call good evil and won't call evil good. And the thing about love is you always side with God. You know, people love to set truth and love against each other. I'm a, I'm a love guy, not so much a truth guy. Or I'm a truth guy, I'm not that interested in love. Here in this very de definition of love, what are we told? Love rejoices with the truth. We side with the truth. Because truth is a person and that person is Jesus Christ. Love. I can't love you and not side with the truth. The truth, for example that the abuse of children is evil. That's a statement of truth. And the thing about love is it always aims to be consistent. So in verse 7 we're told, what is love? It always protects. On the screen, verse 7. It always protects. It always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. It always protects. It always has your back. It always speaks up for those who can't speak up for themselves. That's why we weren't loving over the centuries as we let children not be treated well. And we, you know, the church moved on, ministers, priests and youth workers onto the next church after they did the wrong thing instead of kicking them out. Not from making it an unforgivable sin, but by actually saying you can't do that anymore. You can't be in a role of leadership. It always trusts. It refuses to be cynical. It always hopes. It's handing out second chances. It always perseveres. Love hangs in there when others want to give up. Love doesn't just play the big games. You notice in sport, there are some players that are really good at sort of state of origin grand final matches, right? But they don't turn up week by week. They're kind of underperforming. You know, you get the husband who'll risk his life for the family and take the bullet for the kids and work three jobs. But man, day by day, he's just a grumpy old guy who just uh, refuses to say thank you. But the thing about love is, it's day after day after day. It always protects, always perseveres. That is why so many guys are just, in the eyes of God, the nothing men. Because we just don't love day in, day out. Gifts without love equals nothing. And what we've got to work out is what's true for now and what's true for later. you kind of got to know the, the, the theological time zone you live in. For now, every Christian has been gifted. And by the way, that's why every Christian ought to serve, because God has entrusted you with a gift. These are good gifts. The only problem is they will pass away. They've got a use-by date. In verse 8, we read this about the limitations of gifts. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when, completeness, when completeness comes, what is, sorry, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Everything that is happening in church right now will pass away. In fact, everything that's happening in this world right now will pass away. And, and there's two words that describe uh, these things. Paul says they're both temporary and incomplete. Uh, they're, they're, they're incomplete. They're imperfect. We prophesy in part. We know in part. I will never preach the perfect sermon. That will ne that's never going to happen. So don't wait for it. It's not going to happen. Pray that I preach the best sermon I can preach, but I'm never going to be the perfect sermon. We prophesy, we teach in part, we know in part. And everything is temporary. Everything's got a use-by date. 
Um, things will come to an end. There's going to come a time when Ray Galea will never preach another sermon. Praise the Lord. Take note of that. You, you guys who are perfectionists and you kind of can't live until you hit It ain't going to happen. This side, everything you do is temporary and everything you do is incomplete and imperfect. And the truly spiritual person knows to what, get him, what to be impressed by. Look at verse 11. Now he's using here the imagery of children. Now there's a positive way of using children, like, you know, learn to be like them because they trust God. But there's a childishness that you don't want to be like. It's time to grow up and stop being a baby. And here Paul is describing the Corinthian church like being a little kid that hasn't grown up. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put away childish ways behind me. And Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, and he's saying to us at MBM, grow up, work out what to be impressed by. You know, you give a child a choice between a diamond ring and a Mars bar, guess which one they're going to choose? A five-year-old will choose a Mars bar every time. I hope that's not you. You wouldn't do that, would you? You always go for the million-dollar diamond ring, wouldn't you? You always go for the diamond because that's what lasts. That's what has lasting value. And God is saying here, every Christian's got to work out what lasts and what doesn't last. And if you've got to get impressed, okay, get impressed by a miracle. That's a good thing. Praise the Lord. But you, but you want to get really. But God says you want to really grow up, and you know what to be impressed by. You'd be impressed by those who are sacrificially loving day in, day out. Now that's what impresses me. You know, yesterday, Kim Morris organised a group of carers, people who basically every day have to take care of someone who's very sick or very aged, and it takes all of them. And they're there in, they give their whole life to the care of this person. And so she decided to get them all together. And I thought, in that room, that day yesterday, we had true greatness. For here were people who were loving that's the thing you want to go home. But I tell you what, if we had a miracle story up here, and we had a story about someone who'd been caring for a, someone with MS for, for 10 years, I tell you the story you'd be telling everyone tomorrow. It'll be the miracle. And Paul, and Paul says, you know, that's good, praise the Lord. But that's not the thing that in the end's going to last. That other story about the, the man, say, who stood by his wife, gave up his job so he could care for his sick wife with MS for 10 years. That's the thing that impresses me. Learn what to get impressed by. Greatness is measured by one word, love. It's not that the gifts of the Spirit aren't good and impressive and wonderful. It's that real greatness is tied to the fruit of the Spirit that begins with love. Here are God's heroes. Let's look at verse 12. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I, shall, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know, one writer put it this way, when the sun rises, all the lights go out. It's true, isn't it? Early next, tomorrow morning when the sun rises, all the street lights will go out. Why? Because when, what he's saying is when Jesus appears in all his glory, there won't be any need for any gifts to be used. We will see Jesus face to face. But he says what will last, what won't go out, are three things. Faith, hope and love, and love outranks them all. Because it is the currency of heaven. It is the one thing that will go from this age to the age to come. That's why when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, somewhere else, he said this. He said to the Thessalonian Christians, it was so beautiful. He says, you know when Jesus returns, what do you think is going to be my crown and my joy? The thing I'll be getting a kick out of. And then he says, is it not you guys? You are my crown. You are my joy. That people are not, they're not a means to an end. They are the end to the glory of God. That, this is the thing. Your love for your fellow brother and sister in Christ that's the thing. Your love for, your, for, for the people in your life, that's the thing that carries over into eternity. And why this is so liberating is this. You know, you're thinking, gee, I wish I got this gift or that gift. I wish I could preach. I wish I could speak in tongues. I wish I could be, uh, perform miraculous gifts. And what, and what Paul is saying is, I know you might have thought you were on the back of every line when gifts were handed out. I know you may never be up the front, you know, one of the show ponies up here. But he said, you know what? You haven't missed out on the most important thing. 
the most important thing, the greatest of all, the most excellent way is what? Love. And that is before you every day. So I plead with you people, do not be the nothing people. Here is the warning. Without love, it's not like you're three quarters of the way there or halfway there or a quarter of the way there. Paul is very clear. Without love, you're a zero. But with love, now, that is true greatness. Because remember, love is the only currency of heaven. When you love, it's like you're preparing yourself for heaven. It's the one thing that will keep getting transferred into the age to come. So don't be the nothing person. Highly gifted, but loveless. That would be the greatest of all tragedies. Let's pray. Let's pause for a moment and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you about that particular person who you haven't been loving. Dear Father, you are the God of love. <coughs> Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Each person of the Trinity loving the other, focused on the other. You are a God of love. Forgive us for not loving you. Forgive us for not loving each other. Forgive us for not being patient. Forgive us for being easily angered. Forgive us for being envious. Forgive us for being self-obsessed. Unlike you, Lord Jesus, we keep holding on to the failures of others. We're really sorry. We're sorry for not protecting those who can't speak up for themselves. We're sorry for not hanging in in difficult relationships. Forgive us for being more interested and impressed by the gifts of the Spirit that are going to pass away and not being impressed by love which never ends. Lord, it is only your precious blood that washes away our loveless sins. So wash them, Lord, for they are many. And it is only by your Spirit that we can start to love and please you. Help us to keep in step with your Spirit. Help us to love deeply, to love from the heart, to love truly, and to keep on loving. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen.